Hi, welcome to the Utuna Zalendo podcast. My, my name is Mwalimu Mutemu Akiyama, the host, founder of the Mzalendo Halisi Foundation. Mzalendo Halisi Foundation highlights and amplifies ordinary Kenyans doing extraordinary things. Today, we feature Christo Simeoni, a feminist activist. Kariboni. Hi, Crystal. Hi. It's been a while it's since we last got together. It has. Um, it has. So welcome. Thank, Thank you for being a guest on my podcast. Thank you. Yeah, the Utu Inauzalendo podcast. Uh, and it's about amplifying uh, Kenyans who mostly are people I know at a personal level. I know the work that they are doing. And I believe that the rest, you know, Kenyans and Africa need to know about them and their work. Um, I've always been about amplifying others in mm. everything that I've done, uh, mostly even in my socials and that kind of thing. And I was like, um, there's this platform called Podcasting, Podcasting. Why don't I venture into it? Mm. Please um, introduce yourself. Yeah. Um, what would you like to know? My name is... Your name. Yeah. My name's Crystal Simeone and I'm Kenyan and I, I live right here in Nairobi. Yeah. Yeah. Simeone doesn't sound very Kenyan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my middle name is Wangeshi. <laughs> right. um, but yes, my dad is Italian Seychellois. So his dad was Italian. Um, he passed away many years ago, but he was an Italian prisoner of war in current day Abyssinia. Um, in current day Ethiopia, which was Abyssinia before um, with the World War II. He was conscripted by Mussolini. And the British caught them and frog marched them down to Kenya to a prisoner of war camp. Um, my grandmother was from the Seychelles and her family had been brought here to work for the British. Um, and that's how they met. Um, after the war ended, he was taken back to Italy, but decided this is where he wanted to be. And so he got on a ship and came. And so I guess you could say I'm the product of colonialism in some way. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, uh, so are we all. Yeah, know, yeah. One way or the other. Yeah, my mom is Kikuyu. She's from Nyeri. Um, she was born and brought up in Nyeri, moved to Nairobi, um, was on attachment in Eldoret when she met my father. Um, so yes, I'm a daughter of Kenya, um, a daughter of Africa, and a citizen of this world. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's nice. That's a nice introduction. Do you speak Italian? My Italian is really shaky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very much of a linguist. My brother is much more fluent than I am. Um, I understand Kikuyu. My accent is a bit wanting, so everybody makes fun of me. Um, but I'm really interested in going back and reclaiming my, I don't know, my Kikuyu roots. And I'm really interested in our historic culture um, and all of that. So it's something that I have taken interest in. Um, I'm interested in, in Italian food. I guess it's in my blood. Um, I grew up having pasta and githeri on the same plate, <laughs> <laughs> much to the yeah. shock of both yeah. sides of my family. Yeah. Um, That's but a yeah. new combination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, where in Nyeri did your mom come from? Do you have any? Mokorene. Mokorene. Yeah. Do you have any? Have you ever been there? Do you have any linkages? I go there often, actually. My mom is my mom and my tata have um, an avocado farm. Um, so I go and visit and see, and they've got a little cottage. Okay. Um, yeah. Mm. She lives there? No, she lives in Nairobi, but okay. she goes often. She uh, goes maybe once or twice a week. Yeah, that's nice. Um, there's a lot of people who are actually re- trying to rediscover their roots. Yeah. Uh, and as a feminist, uh, which we'll delve into later, is um, I'm always interested in this conversation that the Kikuyu uh, are matrilineal society. Mm-hmm. Actually, women used to be in power yeah. before the colonialism came. Yeah, when yeah. they had councils of elders instead of singular mm. chiefs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, where did you go to school? Uh, primary, secondary. So, I went to Musangari. You grew prim- up in Nairobi. I grew up in Nairobi. Um, I went to Musangari for my primary school, and then I went to Brayside for my high school, and then I did my international baccalaureate at Saint Mary's. So, a little bit of co- in common with our former president. Um, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I. I went to Italy for my first degree, 
but I really didn't like it. I think I was there for a little less than a year. What was the degree in? It was in political science. Um, but it it dawned on me that the course was very centered on Italy and on Europe. And it's, I mean, that's fine and fair, but it's not a place that I'd ever thought I would want to settle. Um, and I wasn't enjoying the course. And I just like, I, I just, I wasn't okay. Um, and so I applied for a position in Finland. A friend of mine was in Finland. I did a couple of entry um, exams into a couple of universities and got in. So I did my first degree in management because I had no idea what I wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, after speaking to a few people, one of my tatas who is an agricultural economist, um, at least she was practicing then, um, she was like, you know what, don't overthink it. Do something that you can apply in any which direction you would like to go in the future. So I did that. Um, I did my thesis on ecotourism in Kenya, sustainable tourism in Samburu. I was attached to the African Wildlife Foundation while I was doing my thesis and doing my research. And it was really like going out into the bundus in land cruisers. It was great. I got to experience this country um, in a different way. Um, yeah, so Helen Gishohi was like, maybe do something social science to back your business management undergrad. Um, and so I picked a university in Sweden <laughs> to do my course in African studies and rural economic development. Um, one of the reasons I picked it also was the head of the program was Eritrean. Um, and it didn't have too much of an emphasis on linguistics. I'm not a linguist. I'm not really interested in learning languages. I'm really bad at it. Um, but I could carve a specialization, which I did on economic development. Um, so it was really interesting to reconnect with the continent from a historical perspective because it sat in the history department. Um, and to learn about everything, our history, our cultures, um, our geography, um, all the things that I never got to study in school. Um, so that was a really special one and a half, almost two years of my life. Um, and my supervisor, he was Eritrean, Tekeste Nagash, Professor Tekeste Nagash, wanted me to do a PhD. And so got me a placement to do a pre-PhD course or research um, period at the Uppsala African Studies Center, the Institute of African Studies. Still in Sweden? Still in Sweden, in Uppsala. Um, and I did it for two months and I was, as I was there and the library is the most amazing library on Africa that I've ever come across. They have white papers that I would never be able to find even here. They've got books from art to architecture, to policies, to agriculture, everything that you can dream of. They had it in this library. And I remember the first time I went in, it was like, oh my God, you know, and really wishing I could find something similar back at home. And yeah, so I, I spent two months there and in the libraries when I'd look at people's theses, it would be to my family and friends for the seven years I've been writing this. I'm really sorry that I didn't have enough time for you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, is this what I really want to do from a little cubicle in the snow in Sweden? No. Um, but while I was there, I was reading It's Our Turn to Eat based on John Githongo's time in government. And I was so taken by the story and John Githong came to, to give a presentation. And Godwin Murunga, who used to be at Kenyatta University, he's now with Codestria, was there. And he was like, oh, he's my friend. I'll introduce him. And I was like, what? So he gave his lecture. Um, and then I met him. Godwin introduced me. And I said, well, I really want to come home. I don't know where to start, but I'd like a foot in the door. Um, and I'll take anything right now. I can intern, volunteer, whatever it is. And he had spoken about this organization he'd started when he came back from exile in Nuka. And he was like, well, send me your CV. In Nuka, um, Kenya. In Nuka, Kenya. Send me your CV. No promises, but let's see what happens. So I came home knowing that I moved back home, packed my bags. But this PhD journey in Sweden really wasn't for me at that point. Um, sent him my CV. They called me in for an interview in January after Christmas, and I got a Which job. Which year is this? 
My goodness, I'd have to check. <laughs> <laughs> it was 2009. 11 or 9? Oh, 2000, 2009. 9 or 10, yeah. Yeah, I think 9. Um, and so I got a position. I'm not going to say a draw because I think I earned 4,000 shillings out yeah. of petty cash <laughs> a month. And boy, I did everything from figuring out Facebook to... I don't know, writing first drafts of concept notes to running around, to filing, to all sorts of things. He had painted it as an organization, but on the ground, we yeah. took a ground, to me. Yeah, different. very different. <laughs> um, there's, I think, just four of us. But then that's, 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 that's how it starts because um, it is. Um, right now I'm bootstrapping the Rendo Halisi Foundation. Yeah. Um, with Werimo and other, I know, like a few other, one, one other person. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's 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 possible to project a presence that is bigger than than, yeah. than the yes. reality. <laughs> now that I've started, now we, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was it was such a a grounding experience for me. I I did a lot of work on the ground. We did a lot of work around the constitution. We had you know just conversations. That was just before the new constitution. It was just but... before the new constitution. I worked very close closely with Tom Boyer. We had conversations about the constitution and trying to, you know, with debates. Um, we had a project in informal settlements in Nairobi talking about the constitution and what, you know, possibilities it would bring for Kenyans. Um, so it was really, it was really a time that I got to sort of roll up my sleeves, sink my boots into Kenyan soil and get to have a different understanding of our people and our struggles. Now, for my master's, I'd done African studies. My thesis was on the cooperative history in Kenya, and I and I studied the Githunguri dairy. Um, but this was more governance. It was, you know, John Githung was known for corruption. It was governance work. It was constitutional work. Um, I think I knew the constitution back to back almost. I could quote, you know. Um, and I think it really grounded my Kenyanness in that period of time. We also did Wongozi, the TV show, which was an interesting experience. Again, I got to travel the world and uh, not mm. travel the country. The country. Yeah. Um, go to please edit the world out. <laughs> I got to travel the country, um, meet all sorts of people and go to places that I never imagined I would end up with in on the back of a truck doing road shows. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about leadership and I think the the audition period before the actual show when we did all these travels and got people interested in the show to apply to be in this reality TV show, I think that was that gave me a very different understanding of where we are as a country and what we hold dear and not what leadership means to a lot of people, what it doesn't mean. Um, understanding that a lot of the time we know what a bad leader is, but it's very hard for us to articulate what a good leader could be and should be and is. Yeah, actually, actually, that's that's a part of um, Mzalen Halisi Foundation is actually answering that question. Yeah, um, we know we know who the bad leaders are, but we have very few examples. Or even if they are there, we've not articulated, we've not amplified, yeah, or profiled um, who the good leaders are. Yeah, which I hope is what I'm doing with this show because yeah. I consider you a good leader. Ooh. So, so that's part of the, this part of the, uh, you know, the output of this show is that's to actually try, start profiling good leaders, and, and and I can, I can explain why yeah. because um, there's a there's a kind of despondence mm. uh, that we have right now after the current government came into power, and the first co his cabinet, uh, Ruto's cabinet, was appointed. Yeah, uh, and a lot of people say that um, he chose the worst of our society as his cabinet ministers mm. um, and that there's a message that was being sent and and there's that question is don't we have better leaders and i i chose to answer that question and profile the yeah. better leaders so yeah. i think it's a, it's it's a kind of a similar thing to ongozi yeah. but, but done differently yeah um, and it's interesting also that around that time is when we met, around 2011. Yeah. The first time in my, my I think um, after I left the corporate world and, and I yeah. was looking for, again, leadership and integrity yeah. um, away from the corruption in the corporate world. Yeah. And you're my first contact in uh, the <laughs> NGO world. You guys were doing, I think after, after, after the um, Wongozi, 
there was this campaign you guys were doing on Twitter February 28 Kenya February 28 yeah. um and I my first when I opened my first Twitter account I found that trending on Twitter and you were being attacked by the allies <laughs> and the Itumbis. I don't know whether you remember that. I don't even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> What But a throwback. You're facing a lot of pushback. Yeah. Online. Yeah, and we were singing, you know, just an ode to this country and we were singing the national anthem at 1 p.m. on February the 28th. That was it. Um, Because you're saying that uh, the 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 February 28th is when the national accord was signed. Yes. And we had forgotten and moved on, and people are not even commemorating. We were just, I think, we were just um, what two, three years down the line after the national accord, yeah. and people had moved on, like exactly. nothing had happened. Yeah. And you guys were insisting that we need to remember. To remember, and it was a simple call to action. Wherever you were at 1 p.m., just stand and sing the national anthem. That's it. Which kind of seems wild that there would be any pushback <laughs> for something as simple as that. Um, and I think. I don't know sometimes the simplest acts of reclaiming our symbols um I I now wear this Kenyan band I haven't for many years um it was a very traumatizing sort of like didn't want to be associated with it from the last government and what it meant um but at some point was it this year I think or late last year I said you know what it's my symbol as well this country is mine And so it's my attempt at reclaiming it. I sometimes will see somebody making a press statement on TV wearing it and they're of a certain type and I'm sort of like You don't want to be associated with it. Yeah, can I can I tear <laughs> this off? But you know, that's part of the work of reclaiming. Um even when it's difficult and that was what we were doing with February 28. Yeah, and and is it, is it possible that you know there's been a deliberate attempt to desensitize us? from that claiming that space. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. I think there's something very political about ownership and owning your country and everything that it comes with. Um I remember during different, you know, political unrest every time, you know, the railroads are uprooted, right? And everybody's like, well, how this country doesn't feel like it's yours. You don't uproot the carpet off out of your house and throw it out because it's your house, it's your home. Um and if you don't feel like you own this country that it's yours that it's ours then yes you will do that you will burn tires on the expressway because it's not our expressway right it's for a 1% um so there's something very deeply political about ownership um both of our symbols of our rituals of this country in, in all the facets that it comes with and so there's definitely an attack and a trying to desensitize people away from that and you know just live this very capitalist consumer life um and a real attack not and a sort of like trying to blind everyone from 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 that going back to that yeah and it's, you talk about ngozi um because it's ngozi is about leadership mm. um and even uh, if you look at uh, in Uga Kenya still wear the the CC band. band i think you gave me this <laughs> yeah. the first time uh, i can't th- believe you're still wearing it <laughs> it's it. seen some days <laughs> you know um yeah it's been places also yeah um but but it's, it's it's that thing of like it's up to us yeah. um you know um we are the ones we've been waiting for we are the ones we've been waiting for and i think that's what inspired me when i met you and john gidongo um, yeah. about i think in 2011 um and and the question is um you know as activists are usually also painted we are called evil society <laughs> um we are called people who who you know who are never satisfied you're yeah. always criticizing and not offering yeah. solutions yeah. uh what would you see about that like the transformation from that space um anti corruption the pushback from kenyans and that kind of thing what is, what is your experience of it i mean historically kenya has has followed a certain trajectory right um in that immediate post independence in the days of kuruma sankara nyerere well tanzania under nyerere was building a socialist state um building a social fabric we chose a more capitalist more monetary you know economic growth at the center of our development pathway Um we've never really been the country that has joined in this pan-African identity and struggle. You see it now um when the continent is negotiating an Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement to have issues with it. 
but that's where we are. Kenya is negotiating, negotiating on its own, on its own um, bilateral free trade agreements with the US and the UK. Um, so this idea of togetherness, of unity, of Utu, has never been something that has been woven into our, our fabric. Centering the Kenyan. Centering Kenyans, yeah. Centering Africans, centering Kenyans, identifying as Kenyan, identifying as Africans, and really recognizing that we have a collective struggle and we have a shared destiny. And the only way we can get there is collectively. Um, there's a very consumerist, capitalist, economic growth at the center of it um, that has really taken hold of us and of our people. And it seeps into what we educate our children with, um, what values we carry, you know, put into the next generation. And everybody wants to be the next Warren Buffett. Everybody wants to be the next tenderpreneur, the next millionaire. You know, it's, it's an, a very individualistic approach to life. Um, and there's an understanding that, you know, centering self, centering economic growth, there's no space and time for these things. So just please, can we, you know, just yeah, stop Musi complaining. No, 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 no. Yes, yeah. hustle economy, you know, like just pipe down. Um, you can make money if you want to. And there's individual tracks that you can use to make that money. And if you're not making money, you're not working hard Exactly, enough. you're lazy. Um, you're just not working hard enough. It's not your time yet, um, which really sort of muddies the water of what the actual problem is, which is it's a systemic issue. If you're born in a poor region, a poor area, the likelihood of you coming out of that is, you know, next to nothing. Um, and the few cases, the few lucky ones that have, it's sheer luck, really. It's nothing to do with how hard you work or how because if if economic growth was centered on hard work african women in rural areas would be you the know, richest they work extremely hard exactly so it's not about that and there's a need to see a bigger picture of what that is um so you know if we center around that then of course activists and people who are fighting for a centering of actual people at the heart of everything will be a target um and have always been in this country what is your understanding of Utu from that perspective? Utu. Mm. I am because you are. We are because each other are. Um, there's no me without you. Um, we're not created. We're not here to live singular, individualistic lives. We, ca we cannot. Um, countries, states, communities, families are collective. Um, and that's something that we have to reclaim if we're going to have any chance at, at being okay. It's something that we have to reclaim. Uh, and, and I'm asking that because I, I look at our communities. I think we still we are still um, at, the, at, the, at the point where usually when we face challenges, I don't want to call them problems, um, we come together. Whether yeah. it's uh, fundraising for school fees, hospital, hospital bills, to send someone maju, you know, women's merry-go-round, merry-go-round schemes, the chama, table chama banking. Is, you know, like a chama has lifted a lot of uh, women yeah. out of, um, you yeah. know, extreme it's poverty. Solidarity economics, yeah. paid right? school fees for 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 so many. Like, and and and, and it's the Kenyan woman who, or the African woman who who has made that and then mainstream that. Yeah. Um, uh, from uh, your your perspective as a feminist um, and someone who. Oh, that's a heavy question and a very loaded one. I guess, um, I don't know. So I work with a collective called Nawi. I started this three years ago. Um, and it's a pan-African feminist collective of African feminists working on macro level economic narratives. So it's continental? It's continental. Um, it also has some role to play in pushing against global narratives as well. So we can also engage at a global level. Um, and the idea behind this was, one, our struggle is against a patriarchal world order, and that's why we're feminist. And at the same time, our feminism isn't, pa isn't without its Pan-African roots. We have, you know, a specific set of problems, challenges, as I'll use your words, um, 
that are for us, that we have a colonial history, we have a coloniality that we still continue to live through. We have a very extractive global economic governance system that has an apartheid way of organizing, um, using the words of Jason Hickel. And that's still very, very extractive. Um, women's labor and bodies have been upholding not only families and communities, but economies and states, and completely doing it unrecognized, invisibilized, um, underpaid, non-paid. Um, and so opening that up and making sure that those the intersection of both a Pan-African ideology, but also a feminist one, work in tandem. Um, we're feminists, yes, and we say globally feminism is fighting the same war of patriarchy, but we're fighting very different battles. My feminism battles here on the continent is very different from a European struggle. And even here on the continent, you know, me versus someone from um, Angola who have a Portuguese colonial history, what does that look like? But then again, even in Kenya, me who lives in Nairobi versus a woman who lives in Wajir, our problems also similarly quite different. And so recognizing the intersectionality of all of these dynamics, um, looking at macro level economics, I don't call it macroeconomic because macroeconomic suggests a set framing. Macro level will include analysis on um, social reproduction, those kinds of things that macroeconomic policies and framings completely ignore. Um, the macroeconomic framework is ahistorical and it's apolitical. Um, but we know that economic systems are very political and very historical. Uh, we're called Nawi. Um, now it's kind of famous after the Woman King movie. Or the no, Nawis. Exactly what I'm going to explain. Um, so Nawi is the name of the last known Dahomey which were the first ever recorded all-women fighting regiment in Karande Benin. So the movie The Woman King is based on them. Um, and actually, there's one of the characters now. She's the last known survivor of the Dahomey. And so it's an ode to memorializing the names of African women who are completely invisibilized through the way we tell our history. Um, but it's also an ode to an anti-colonial struggle they fought against the French. Um, and so it's an ode to fighting against colonialism and coloniality and neocolonialism, if there's any such thing that exists. I think we're still in a colonial space. Um, and that's where now we came from. We later found out that it also means home in Ngar Turkana. And it's the home of a group of very passionate African feminists, Pan-African feminists, um, who are interested in contributing to a Pan-African feminist narrative of the economy. A lot of the time when you hear about Africa, women, and the economy, it will usually be at a micro level. It'll be very individually targeted interventions, microfinance, here's one chicken or two chickens, here's one cow, you know, those kinds of things. And I say that's well and good. However, even if you give me two cows, I still need to be able to take my children to school. I still need to be able to access a universally accessible um, hospital. I'll still need to move on a public road in public transport. And so upholding that social contract between the state and the citizen is really, really important. Um, and those are systemic issues that we have to deal with. Um, and over time, both funding but also interest, there hasn't been too much work done with regard to feminist analysis and macroeconomic or macro level economic narratives and policies. There has been, I mean, I was reading a book by Dawn, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era from 1984. They could have been writing for current day realities on the economy. So there has been, maybe not as many, but there definitely has been. Um, a little few on the continent, but that's been really growing. And the, the feminists that have been speaking about these issues have been speaking over and over and over again for so many years. All we need to do is listen. Yeah, so that's Nawi. Yeah, that's, that's a, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, especially um, in our society. And I think you, you also face a lot of pushback even from uh, the women you're advocating for. Um, there's, there's not even just because fe feminism is not just about women. It's about society mm. and patriarchy perpetuated. I mean, it's perpetuated through the entire society. Mm. Um, and... Um, um, there's, there's this 
uh, narrative or, or, or misconception that feminism is about fighting men. Um, what would you say about that? Yeah, and that's sort of like a very lazy way to describe it, actually. Um, I don't know. Like many people have spoken about how feminism is a fight for just the sheer, at a basic level, men and women have equal, should have equal presence, control and power in this world. Um, feminism centers power dynamics at the center of its analysis um, and looking at who holds power, who doesn't hold power, what are those dynamics and how can we rebalance that? Um, and that's that's really what it is. It's quite simple. It's not as complicated. I know there are different feminisms. Um, you know, you have eco-feminists and radical feminists. I defy I, identify as a pan-African uh, feminist. Okay, pan-African feminist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are intersectional people who identify as intersectional feminists. There's all sorts of feminists. But really at the heart of it is this fight against the patriarchy, against that, that power imbalance. Um, at the heart could, of it, could, that's could you what it is. Could unpack that a bit, like patriarchy and power imbalance, like how it manifests in Africa, in Kenya? Yeah, and also recognizing that also, even in Africa, um, culture is never static, right? And it evolves. So two things. One, that this this two this two kind of divides. There's a divide that is like African culture, and there are many cultures on this continent who are backward, um, not inclusive of women and all of that. Not remembering that culture evolves and you can never pick one period of time and call that a culture and it's static. There's another divide that can romanticize our history and our culture saying, no, but, you know, women were this and had more power and all of that. Um, and I think it's not so black and white and there's very many degrees. And again, culture all, or always evolves. Um, so I think, I think it's been a continuous battle and a fight. I think you can have stories that tell both sides. I think there's always been a battle um, in terms of power dynamics, in terms of who has agency, who has voice. Women, actually, women always have voice, but who's allowed to be listened to and whose voices are infused and influencing certain processes, whether it's at a household level um, at a country level, at a regional level, at a global level, who gets to be in certain spaces? Um, who gets to world make, to imagine new worlds and new ways of organizing? Um, that's that, that. Those kinds of analysis is is what we we do. And, and for and, us, and how it's in the economic space. For, for example, we have to imagine a world where there's no patriarchy. How mm. that? Uh, make society better, make Africa better, make so Kenya better. So actually that reimagination is something that everybody struggles with. Um, the politi And feminists do this a lot, the politics of imagination. Um, and it's sometimes sold, not sold, it's sometimes pushed aside as fluffy. You know, it's just like imagination, what is this nonsense? Can we give me hard things? But feminists always push, and African feminists, you can't, you can't work towards something that you can't imagine in your mind's eye where you're working towards. Uh, and so we did, and now we, we oscillate between the technical and the colloquial. And within that also imagination being used as a tool and a strategy of how we do this. So we did um, a policy analysis of COVID and what economic alternatives there could be. Um, from a Pan-African feminist perspective, this piece beautifully written, published in Feminist Africa. And we took the same piece and said, okay, let's do something creative and a reimagining. If all these things came to life, what is this world that we, we would exist in? And that was really hard for us. Mm. And they're so sad. I can imagine. Because um, mm. you can, you know, you can very easily articulate the hospitals don't work, the police are violent, da, 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 da. But if you stop and say, okay, if everything worked in the way that we wanted, what, how, how, when you wake up in the morning, what happens? And if you get sick, what happens? Um, where do your children go to school? Do you feel safe? Like all of those things are really, really actually hard to imagine. But we think it's important to do that, then you can work backwards. Um, and so you asked me, actually, if you pause, I'm going to get my phone to read something. Okay. Is that okay? okay. All right.
Okay, so this is from a piece called In a Time Not So Far Away. Um, and this was really an, a reimagining of things. And I'll read just a small bit. It's, it's much long. It's, it's a little book, actually. Um, so it says, GDP is no longer a thing. Here they measure happiness, wellness, leisure, love, safety, shelter, education, freedom, beauty. They measure the health of the people, the soil, the waters, and the air. They measure life. All these are signs of wealth, indicators of an economy of abundance for all people. Here, all the gains are shared and all of the people are cared for. Here, it is clear that there is enough for the living to live. In this place, the harvest must always be mutual. And so that's sort of an imagining of what the world could be, where there isn't an excess for a select few, um, but there's an abundance for everyone. And I think we do live in a world where we can have an abundance for everyone if everything is in mm. is in measure, mm. right? If, mm. if not, who is it, Sankara, that says that said, it's either we choose champagne for a few or water for everyone. Um, and that's sort of this idea of the harvest must always be mutual. Everyone must always have. Um, and if we do that, nobody will ever be left with without. Um, so that's an imagining of this world that we're trying to create, where everyone has a place, everyone is rightfully here, um, everyone is deserving, and everyone is deserving of, of quality, of dignity, of happiness, of joy, of rest. Um, and rest of is... Utu. Of Utu. It's exactly <laughs> that, yeah. You know, um, and, and um, without romanticizing it, there's, um, there's a school of thought that... Um, Africa before colonialism, um, and especially the Bantu communities in Africa were mostly largely matrilineal, whereby uh, women were, were, were kind of in power. Um, and that patriarchy came with, we look about the colonial, the colonial came with, with colonialism. Um, and I can talk about, you, you talked about your Kikuyu heritage, I can talk about uh, my part of it, also my Kikuyu heritage. and. Um, one thing that fascinates me is the fact that we talk about Gikoyo and Mombi, Gikoyo being the father and Mombi being the mother of the community, uh, being Mombi meaning creator. And then you talk about their nine or ten daughters, um, you know, which who form the, the names, the, the clans, the new clans are named after their, their daughters. That whether they were nine or ten, yeah, these that's are, also <laughs> these subject are, to yeah. These are these are these are these are, these are thing there. Yeah, um, and and the interesting thing for me is that they got married to start the community or the tribe, as the uh, white people called us, uh, or as Kenyans refer to us as to, uh, you know tribe, which is problematic. Mm -hmm. But we don't know who married them. Like we don't have a single name of apart from Gikoyo, the only that's man true. in that space. Is Gekoyo. Yeah. Uh, so we have nine or ten women who we know their their names, yeah. including the tenth being Washera. Yeah. Um, and we have a community that where the men there's a lot of patriarchy um, in the Kikuyu community, um, and the men proudly wear their clans, which are named after women, but yeah. they never see the irony of yeah. it. Um, and and so. I don't know whether you've studied uh, matrilineal societies, mm. African societies, mm. and how that would be different if, if um, you know, if you, had, you know, you can't go back to the past, but if you could adopt yeah. some of the. Yeah, but I also wonder, even in terms of the patriarchy that we see within Kikuyu communities now, how much of it was it ours, and how much was it influenced by external factors, right? Um, so when the British came and the British really, for, for the British, Kenya was a settler country, mm. Kenya and Zimbabwe. Mm. These were two in countries. South Africa, I think, yeah. Well, so, yeah, but yeah, South Africa of. has a different kind of history. But within the, you know, the rest of the continent, Kenya and Zimbabwe were where they, they knew they were going to settle. Um, and unlike many other regions, they brought their upper class here. And so if you look at even what habits and customs and ways of life that we adopted it's very elitist mm -hmm. you and know? classist it's very very classist so you will have a male servant for the man of the house 
Um, we have gardeners. How many Kikuyu grandmothers go betting on horses? Like it's kind of, if you if you sit back, it's kind of like wait what? Yeah. Um, and, and 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 clubs and clubs, country clubs, and those kinds of things. And it's important to remember that their colonialism practice was also very interlinked with their Victorian Christian state of being, where a woman's place was in the house, whereas. Kikuyu women didn't stay in the house. Yeah, they you know? didn't. Mm-hmm. But now when they came in the consulata mission or whatever, you're taught the woman's place is in the house and the man's place is outside. And gender roles then are ascribed in a certain way. And that mixed in with tr- an attempt to hold on to our culture in whatever little ways that we are corrupted. And in its, in its place and emergence of uh, this weird mix of like a little bit of Kikuyu culture but really centered in like Victorian Christian you know practice that is very patriarchal um, existing in a state that is colonial and colonized by you know a certain history and a certain pattern it's kind of hard to then undo all of that and really see what is actually Kikuyu culture Because even this argument of the nine or ten daughters, the first documentation of Kikuyu culture, I think, written in that form was by the Leakeys. Um, And, and, you know, there's conversations about like, you know, Kikuyus don't count children. And so even counting whether it was nine or ten and even the undercurrents of what Washera, you know, who she was and what she did and that was also a bit touchy to have a conversation about. And so maybe that's why she wasn't counted, but he would never have known that nuance. So how do we really know? Because we also had an oral culture of passing on history and knowledge. My mom's grandfather had 46 wives. He was a chief. Of course, a chief because the British appointed him a chief. Um, And she remembers, she doesn't remember the whole song, but she remembers being taught songs that help them remember their ancestors and so it was it was passed on in music and song and also the naming and, oral, and, the and naming mm. and that's how our story is passed on but in a way where epistemologically there's a hierarchy of what is counted as knowledge and documentation of his history that it has to be written in a book for it to be actual history and documentation in a world where that wasn't the practice and so i question like there's even a, a question at some level of um the the the, the community being called the recoil because uh, i think if you go deep into it you have the nyeri we have the uh, uh made to be and all this as being um i mean the, the the communities around mount kenya having very distinct self-identity but then all having I think similar spirituality, um, worshiping guy of the mountain, and then being branded as Gikoyo because yeah. of that, 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 that the, and the story and the creation yeah. story. Yeah. But not having, you know, it's, it's, I think uh, I find it very hard to have these conversations. Like uh, we were never, most probably we were never even Gikoyo. Um, that yeah. was a creation of the Likis. Exactly. Um, and then when you do, when you have that conversation, uh, how do you then, you know, uh, a whole identity has been created around that. We are the guys who fought for independence yeah. and all that. And that also perpetuates the patriarchy. Yeah, and so you're attacking a certain you're narrative. Attacking, you're at- attacking an identity. Yeah. You know, yeah. how do we unpack this? Because uh, it's it's quite complicated. It's very complicated. And again, when you talk about patriarchy, and so that's why for me it's very hard to say because how do you know if you're not talking to your grandmothers and your great-grandmothers who unfortunately now are leaving us? But I remember my mom telling me a story of her tata, her dad's sister, who was married with her husband. And he came home drunk one day at 2 a.m. and asked her, demanded that she slaughter a chicken for him. And she was like, oh, hell no. (laughs) Not (laughs) this babe. At 2 a.m. And she left. She left and my grandfather, my mom's father, built her a little house in his compound. And that's where she lived and died. Um, And these stories never are told of resistance, of saying, actually, no, 
um, of standing up to the patriarchy. And I tried to like unpack the story of, of her tata and I was like, so was she like a troublesome type of like manga type, you know, was she like those women? And my mom's like, actually, no, she wasn't. She just didn't want to do this. Like she, this wasn't her role in life and she just decided enough and it was enough. It didn't even follow the patterns that the st of the stories that I tell myself of the type of women that would do that because it's usually the noisemaker, the trouble, rebellious, you know, troublemaking type of woman. She wasn't. Um, and so unless we we tell the stories, really, how do we know if we're relying on a book written by a white man? And this, this, this is the story of my mom. My mom, uh, I consider feminist. She passed on in 2016. Mm. Um, and my mom was married to my dad. Um, I was... Um, um, I don't know whether I should say this, but uh, very narcissistic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but also the kind of man who who gets married, mm -hmm. has kids, mm -hmm. but on the all he does is contribute seed. Yeah, uh, plays no role in in the in the upbringing. And um, my mom is the one who saved money initially to buy land, yeah. and give it to her husband. The guy misused the land, mm -hmm. uh, the money. Uh, Conda that he had bought land, she went and started farming and then discovered that he had not, he not mm. paid for that land. She saved a second time. She was a primary school teacher and gave him the money. Mm. And he did the same thing mm. with his dad also. And eventually she just divorced him, which was totally unheard of in, exactly. the, in, the, in 1983. Yeah. Uh, because um, that time it was like you, you are ostracized by your own society. Um, and um, she went and bought land somewhere. He came and took everything. She went and bought land somewhere um, and, and started life. Um, and then because cause she had to move away now from where they were living near the, the extended family yeah. because of the, you know, the shame of, mm. uh, you know, the, the labeling and that kind yeah. of thing. But even where she went um, as a single mother, that time single mothers were totally unheard of. Oh. she found that um, she was regarded in a certain way by the society. Mm. So after divorcing, divorcing, divorcing my dad officially and dropping his name, she had to retake his name so that she could live within that society mm. without being judged, mm. you know, like chorus of Mrs. Kiyama. Mm. Although she had totally she has done nothing with to, that life. Yeah. You know, and, and I consider that very powerful yeah. for, for a woman like a queer woman of her age, of her age, of at her, that generation, time, her generation, in the society she in was the society living in, she was living yeah. in, you know, yeah. Um, and and she taught us, she brought us. We had three three brothers and uh, and a sister, and we were we all shared chores in the house and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and and this is the eighties, so you know it's interesting that we are still having conversations around patriarchy. Um, yeah. Twenty thirty years yeah. later. Yeah, I don't know how do how do we how do we cross over? The world this? border is also patriarchal, right? I mean, we haven't crossed to an equal like a threshold of equality anywhere. Not in the Nordic countries, definitely not in the U.S., um, not in Europe. Like, I can't think. Uh, the closest I could maybe get is like maybe New Zealand, but even then former prime minister left, you know, saying sort of like, um, I'm, I'm exhausted because it's a constant fight. It's not, it's, you're not just a leader, but you're a woman and you're fighting back so many things that your male counterparts would never imagine having to fight. It's in the small mundane to the very big loud in your face. Um, so it's still there and it's a constant battle. Um, and then overlay that with a cultural confusion that we have here. We've got one foot trying to cling on to a static culture and cultural practice versus modernity and like trying to be modern and civilized is what they call it. Um, it's a very interesting word. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's what's rammed down our throats. You know, you're so uncivilized, like put yourself together, whatever that is, right? And, and this, it's like, a bipolarity of who, how do you identify at a very basic level. Overlay that with power dynamics of the genders and of systems and structures, it's it's. Messy. And then the systems that you, are, for example, if it's the West um, and uh, our former colonialists, the British, and then uh, Americans, 
uh, that were touted as the, you know, the, the examples of civilization. And then when you look at them closely, the societies are falling apart. There's nothing, but you're busy trying to copy them in everything. Do what we say, but don't do what we do. Um, yeah, you're right. They're, co they're falling apart in any way you want to look at it in terms of democracy. Give me one, you know, former, former colonial power, um, that is democratic. I can't name one, um, be it social provisioning. I, I like I was in Cambridge a few months ago and people were joking, not so joking, saying, please don't get sick because we have no ambulances. You'll have to Uber to the hospital. Okay. Um, I have a friend whose mother was in hospital over the weekend and she was saying, but we just, the doctor doesn't come in and the nurses are not as many as they are in the week. I'm sure it's the same in Kenya. And I was like, well, not quite. Um, it's falling apart. Um, they may not want to admit it, but it is. It's falling an, apart in spite and despite of them not even being able to uphold the system, right? So I think there's a statistic that says, over 60% of labor and raw materials come from the global south, but the global south only accrues 5% of global wealth. So we continue to build their economies continuously, relentlessly, and they're still falling apart. The fabric and the framing in which it sits on is shaky and is never meant. Which is, uh, I mean, last anything. 400 years of dehumanization, yeah. of, and especially of the African person, yeah. the people from. The rest of the you know the global south and 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 that brings you know that, that question of is there a future or do we you know just curl into a fetal position and hope something happens i would like to curl up in a fetal <laughs> position and hope something happens <laughs> but i don't think we have the luxury to yeah. um i think we sit at a you know when COVID happened i really like with all its trauma and everything and and it was clear that africa didn't experience COVID in the way that the West thought mm -hmm, we would, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And I remember all the planes. That's what it needs to be written. Dipl it does, mm -hmm. and it needs to be written by us. Mm -hmm. um, and actually a friend of mine is doing a project where he's looking at European development from an African perspective. You know how they study us? Like, let's study them with our lenses. Center of European Studies. Exactly. Based in Nairobi. Exactly, somewhere. exactly. He's Just actually... like the way African <laughs> Studies was based in Sweden. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Center of European <laughs> Studies, you know? Let's try and understand this phenomenon. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a few theories, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious to hear them and curious to put you in touch and see what magic comes up. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember during COVID, there was like all these diplomatic planes shuttling people out and, you know, all of this, like Africa's probably just going to completely disappear. You know, the people of Africa are going to be gone because they definitely can't handle this. And to be fair, even in the very beginning, when Italy was crashing when there was bodies in like cooling trucks in new york even i was like oh we're never gonna make it out and especially because in new york is actually black people who are suffering more exactly than... exactly but that has such a strong correlation with poverty levels right and inequality at the heart of it um and i really thought as we came out of it that this was the moment this was the moment where this thing called COVID had shown the ugly underbelly of this beast of neoliberalism. And, you know, in Spain, they were renationalizing hospitals because they realized you can't you can't face a pandemic with private hospitals. It has to be national. It has to be public. And I was like, maybe something's going to happen. But it didn't. Um, and not only did it not, such large parts of the way that we run the world, organize our economy, is exactly the same. Um, I attended the Commission on the Status of Women in New York, which is a global convening every year at the United Nations in New York for Women, and it's a normative framing space. And I attended for the first time this year after three years of being away. Three years of being away, having some silence to rethink things as many of us did, rethinking, you know, why are we doing things the way that we do? And I went back into this space and it's exactly the same. The same thing. It's same exactly the thing. same. We complain about no visas for Africans. You then have an empty chair for the, Af the poor African that didn't, wasn't able to make it. You're lining up in the winter, in the cold for hours for this badge that you'll never enter some rooms because of security clearance. Like it's, it's a sham, you know? And I got so despondent. And that's and like, at the highest level. That's know? at the highest level. 
um, where I thought maybe this is the moment where the world recognizes that this inequality is never going to get us anywhere. And maybe like Arundhati Roy said, we're at a cusp where like we're at a fork in the road and we can decide to go. We, we had a choice to go either way and we didn't. We didn't. So we're now sitting with the aftermath economically of what COVID did to our economies, um, which is now bringing this whole debt crisis and us begging with our bowls as usual to the World Bank and them pushing more debt on us and private solutions for your very public problems. And the same story again and again. And somebody said the other day, you know, us going to the World Bank, Ghana signed, I think, their 16th or 17th program. It's like going to the doctor with the same problem 16 times. He recommends the same thing and you still keep going. Like, it's it's madness, you know? You know, like, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, madness, insanity. That's that's what um, Albert Einstein said. You exactly. keep doing the same thing over and over. Yeah. Expecting, expecting different, different results. results. You know? And when I look at that, you know, like at that macro, macro level, when I, look, when I look at civil society space you and I met in um, in Kenya, it's the same thing. It's Just, exactly um, the same. same. Workshops, talk shops. Capacity building. Capacity building. I don't, I don't know, know what that even means. Like, press conferences. Yeah. And, you know. Um, <laughs> At Ufungamano. And you keep going. Yeah. And it's the same people. And, you know? and the people in power learn your tactics and they sort of just like even almost just step over you as they continue to do what they're doing. Um, and I think we have to be smarter than that. We have to be more strategic. We have to really rethink. Um, I think at a point last year, I was like, well, I don't, I, I don't know the civil society that I knew and there's no new civil society coming up. But I'm really encouraged to see like new spaces like this, um, the social justice centers really coming up in very different ways. Um, there's, I, I feel like maybe there's a di there's a shift and a different energy happening that people like me who were used to an old civil society way of convening aren't even seeing. And I don't know what that means. Um, but I think it's important for us to, one, make space, but for us to really question the ways that we do all these workshops, capacity building, and also our relationships with our donors, right? Because um, that's, that's what influences most of this. Exactly. You, you bid for money. Um, for a pot of money for a fund that already has been set um, in what you're going to do and your reporting and what you do is always donor first. It's how am I going to report for this? How does it fit in line with donor requirements and all of that? Right down to like how you brand um, and compliance around that. It's if you at a very rudimentary level it's madness. It's madness because I, I, I mean this there's, um, there's something, I, before I joined Inuka, actually, um, came across this document about uh, manufacturing dissent. Mm. And there was a quote from the president of Ford Foundation in 1979 saying, the purpose of civil society is to make the world safe for capitalism. Um, <laughs> and the way you do that is by keeping people busy yeah. doing exactly what you're describing. Yeah. Because yeah. then the people, you and I are caught up in that. Yeah. Then you cannot really challenge uh, the, because you're the, trying to figure out systems. what an output and an outcome is, yeah. <laughs> and then you get caught up in the money, in the money and the power plays and the of power it. Play. Um, you get used to a certain lifestyle because you're earning above average uh, from the rest of Af Kenyans or Africans. Then you take your kids to another to a certain school. Then you need to be able to afford that school. Yeah, and so you cannot really challenge the system because now you become part and of actually the system. even. Many times you're not even paid well enough to, you're you're still scrambling, trying to fit in to your capitalist mm. counterparts you who work in banks, right? Because you have this you exactly. have NGO. And, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and so I really, there's something that sits uncomfortably there. And the pitting against each other that that also brings because you're competing for money, you know, you are pitted against each other. Um... And and that's kind of worrying. You're kind of busting the bubble about the glamour of working in the angel world. Oh, there's no glamour. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're Kenya sees, you know, evil society. No, people there's paid no by glamour. Donors. It's it's rough. It's it's really it's it's tough. It's rough. Um, but I think at the same time as yes, donors and the things that they come with, I think I can slowly see a few. 
that are beginning to see that and they'll tell the donors what they need to hear and do then what they want to do but you have to be brave for, the, for to do that that's what I've always done yeah um Brian Kagoro talks about I don't know if I can mention his name. Yeah, you can. A, f- a friend. Brian, Brian is, a, is a good friend and, I'm, uh, I, and he speaks his mind. So, yeah, you know. It's, you know, it's about raiding imperial coffers to do the work that this continent needs to be done, um, which I think is important. And also, I mean, we're dealing with such different age divides as well that see the world completely different. Um, I'm still struggling with trying to figure out, you know, <laughs> um how to navigate that space as well um but yeah I, i think movement building is something that we can't let go of the feminist movement has been there before the donors will be there after the donors have been there despite and in spite of the donors and so we have to hold on to that um that our movements have always been there will always build, been, be there and that's what we need to focus on building these projects I mean you can use them to get the money but that's not where change is going to come from that is not what liberation looks like it's not what this continent's freedom looks like um our movements that are built by us is where is where the hope lies it's where liberation lies um and that those movements have to be pan african but they is must that, always be feminist I was going to ask like where, what next you know like We have to we build, need to build movements. movements. We have to build the movements. Um I think that immediate post independence period that I spoke about the days of Nyerere, Sankara, all the greats um were very important. They showed what's possible. So even all these things that we're fighting for is not in abstract. We had them. My parents talk about in Nairobi where the street lights would tell you how fast you needed to be driving to be able to hit all the street lights green. I'm like is that a utopian kind of like where is that because even in Europe does it <laughs> yeah. you know you could you could set your clock using the Kenya bus Exactly exactly um so it's not it's not an imaginary utopic vision it's one that we had and so these are lessons I'm part of a post colonialism today project that looks at economic policies at that time and seeing if there's lessons that we can borrow for now um and we like to say they are lessons by africans for africans it's we've done it before it's not something that we're trying to recreate out of nowhere we've done it before of course you know the time has changed and so things will have to be tweaked but there was a point where we had very people centered approaches to development and to what economic development social like all these t- forms of what they look like if you center people rather than gdps and economic growth at the heart of of our thinking Um and movements were strong then and I think we have to reclaim that. I think the funding landscape has done some work but also has fragmented us a little bit. Um and really put us in very siloed approaches. I work on tax, I work on SRHR, I work but life doesn't happen like that and I keep saying I don't wake up today and say I I like to say I don't wake up today and say I'm going to live SDG 5 today and tomorrow I'll live SDG 2. life is happening all at once in its complexity and movements know that and recognize that and because movements are made up of actual people that are living their lives um and build, building power to address their issues building power of resistance um i don't like to use resilience as a as a point of reference because i feel like resilience in a way celebrates hardship in a way yeah, that it's it like, shouldn't yeah uh, it's okay you're poor yeah, you live without poor survive but you're resilient poor, survive, just keeps yeah, smiling just keeps, you know you know yes yeah. <laughs> the african women smile despite the loads on their heads like it's nonsense um but resistance uh, that's where it comes from and so i think we need to reclaim that and and focus on building and our movement say about ngos that have tried to you know claim the movement space by labeling their programming movements or campaigns movements I mean they always will try but they're not. You can you know you can call yourself but you're not. And it's important for us to recognize that they're not. Um and recognize and be strategic and tactical about how to engage with them because we have to. Um but recognizing that they are not true and real movements. Um and and doing the hard work of building and continuing to build our movements in the way that is true. Um and and that is grounded and rooted that's that's really the only way i think um and building our movements you know also across this continent um i think that's important to recognize that africa has a shared history a shared struggle 
a shared resistance and a common destiny. Uh, and the only way we'll ever form any meaningful resistance is if we come together. Yeah. I think Kuma said that in it is that we have to unite, you know. Yeah. For, and, and I think one of the reasons why he, over, he was overthrown or Sankara was killed, every, every, everyone who called for unity, African unity at that time, was taken out. Yeah. And it's not just by happenstance, it was by design. Yeah. And it's becoming clear and clearer that, um, I mean, I'm part of Africans rising, uh, that, that we have to figure out how to unite despite our governments yeah. refusing to and figure out how to resist um so the african union is over 70 percent externally funded that has a direct implication on what their priorities for this continent are they just joined the uh, g20 uh, what does that mean for us for africans i'm waiting to see what that means like <laughs> Knowing who's at the helm of our countries, because they keep saying the African Union is nothing but, you know, the member states. It means going back to look at what your own country's um, foreign policies are, are about. Um, and when I look at my own country, Kenya. Because I, I, I look at, I looked at that as, we say Africa is a country. Mm. We've been calling for unity. Exactly. Then Africa has joined. As one, as one, one entity. But then, how, what countries. does that mean to our different? We call them at Africans Rising. We call them provinces. Yeah. I see. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm an African from the Kenyan province. Yeah. Um, or I wear the Ghanaian flag yeah. or the Ghanaian province yeah. or the South African yeah. province. Yeah. But but then, how does this good thing? Ideally, that would have been a good thing for Africa to be one country, maybe not to join the G20, mm. but be seen as one country. What does that say about where we need to go? I mean, you can see the fruits of that sort of labor in different ways. So with um, the fight against illicit financial flows, there was a, a high-level panel put together under um, Thabo Mbeki, former president of South Africa, and that was under the auspices of the African Union. Um, and they did, you know, they, defi they defined the problem for the continent with, you know, tell me you're working with, uh, tax with the Tax Justice Network Africa. Um, and because it had, it created a common narrative, a common description of the problem and a way forward. This is what we are working towards. I think we're the first region that has had that sort of thing. I had a conversation with someone from the Colombian um, finance ministry last week at the climate summit um, and they were saying how they're trying to do the same in Latin America but there isn't really a Latin a pan Latin American identity or politics and the same for Asia so in that sense I think we're a little a few strides ahead of other regions um, what I worry about is an infiltration of this by external factors so when I talk about who's funding the African Union, that's a critical question. Because and the African Climate Summit. All, all of those things, you know. Um, when you have former American dignitaries telling us, you know, we had to be here to help you set this up. When you look at what the Kenyan government's priorities are with regard to climate and the climate crisis, are they really ours? Well, for me, it was... It was um, and some, some people call me cynical, but for me it was quite obvious. Um, Luto took over a broke government, of mm. which his previous government, where he was deputy president, mm. made the country broke. Mm. Um, and he saw the easy money. You know, climate change money is low-hanging mm. fruit. Mm. So cast yeah. himself as a Pan-African, as a champion for climate. And When you talk about carbon markets... Are you really centering Kenyans exactly, in that like, conversation? Mm. And who is it for? I think those are questions that we need to to begin questioning. And I think also the role of civil society now is to recognize that they sometimes play a role in gatekeeping conversations. Um, sort of if you don't speak in a certain technical, jargon-heavy way, you don't really know what you're talking about. But I think... The role of civil society is to also open up those doors and conversations because these are conversations about life. Um, this idea that these issues are too technical for everyday people to understand is part of the problem. Um, and Jayati Ghosh talks about change can only happen from a groundswell up. 
It will not come from a few policy wonks that understand the nitty gritty of paragraph five in a document, right? It, it, it comes from a people demanding um, for change, um, for their lives to be different, for us to recenter social contracts between us and our state and to move away, you know, private investment, for example, big private finance. Um, those are questions that we have to recenter and reclaim for ourselves. So with the African Union, I think like I can see with the IFF conversation, I can see what that what that led to because the AU put out this document. It described the problem for Africa. It also meant that civil society has a platform or, or a baseline from which to work from. And I've seen this, the difference in, in regions in the global space. Africa is united. They speak as a common, common group. Um, it's followed now with moving tax framing away from the OECD, which is really just a bunch of rich countries that African, many African, African countries actually don't have space at the table and moving it towards a UN space that can we have tax discussed at the UN? Because at least we all sit there. How democratic the UN is, I think we also have to question. But that move is something. And that really, that push was led by the Africa group. Um, recognizing that we're in this together, we're more powerful if we're if we're in a collective. Um, so I can see that happening. I, will, I think I saw, was it last week I saw the Secretary General of the UN talking about uh, restructuring the financials, the global Financial system. Yeah, and, I think and that's, that's part of and it. And that's part of it, exactly. Um, so I definitely see the power in Africa uniting in collective and pushing. I've seen it, I've, I'm, we're seeing it happening right now. Um, but because it's happening, we also have to be careful to guard it um, and not have the Germans come in into the African Union and suddenly. It's a German agenda and the African and the Union. And the Dems and whoever. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's something that we have to be careful of. And I think the other thing that we, we really must find a way to do is to bridge the gaps between national and local level movements and civil society and regional and global. And now I, I talk about global civil society that are African because there's an assumption that you can't be global if you're African and if you're African you can only work on African issues but you can't be influencing global economic you know systems and structures from an African perspective and rooting and so how do you bring together to a table to have conversation national local level organizing and regional global facing organizing as well because there's sometimes not space for those two to meet. And there's also a power hierarchy there that I feel sometimes. And I think there needs to be a lot more work to make those bridges happen. Are you doing that at Nawi? Yeah, we're trying. Um, so it's we're currently doing some work on illicit financial flows. Uh, we did a bit in Uganda. We're now doing some in Angola and I think Senegal. Um, and bringing those conversations into the fore, we launched a conceptual framing of public services from a Pan-African feminist perspective, from a regional perspective last year in Chile at a public services um, uh, conference. And one of the questions that we got pushed back on is like this, this whole obsession with centering of the state when the state is so violent. When, I, when the person who was asking us, she works at national level, I think even sub-national, and she's like, the state is the most violent entity. Yeah, it has the legal monopoly of legal violence. Exactly. Um, so how can you continue to pushing for, to you know, pushing for this centering of the state? And we've been doing a lot of thinking around that and having different conversations with different people. And I think I mentioned to you, I had a conversation with Lino Some, who's at the Institute, the Institute of Social Research at Macare, talking about, yes, we can't do away with the state because then how do you provide um, healthcare and education and public transport, all of those things in a way that's accessible and universally accessible for everyone. But the role that we have to play also is pushing for a decolonized manifestation of the state and the, the states that we currently have are very colonial. A very colonial Machiavellian. Exactly. And so we have to push for a reimagined state to center as we continue to fight for the centering of I the state. I think that's what the Constitution 2010 was 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 meant to do um, by devolving power, removing exactly um, power from the center and taking it to the regions yeah. within Kenya. Yeah. 
and and it has it has been fought by uh, you know fought vehemently um trying to recentralize throughout uh, the last regimes yeah um, and, and i think um the current regime that has been the agenda from the word mm. go mm. you know with now luring by decrees we like we have no courts we have yeah. no parliament we have yeah. even no cabinet yeah in all of that you still see the role of civil society as fragmented and with all its problems they're who we have and they constantly continuously are fighting in various ways in ways that maybe need refreshing but you know they're still there and and that's also something that even with funders sometimes it's not the new sexiest thing on the block right there's some there's some work that is just boring and dirty but just needs to be done it's a work of continuously holding the line it's not even pushing for pro it's just holding the line and that people don't recognize that enough um holding the line whether it's making sure that we're in court making sure that we're educating people to understand what this actually means for their everyday lives that work continues to be done a lot of it is underfunded um but i see it all the time and i you know i think i'm much old i'm not young anymore <laughs> i have too many gray hairs for that but i see like the madari social justice centers like these young people are speaking truth to power in ways I, at the pan african women's liberation celebration at the national theater one of the young women told martha kurwa listen we went to the streets um because we can't afford to live get your politics off our plates get your politics off our plates and i it gave me a little bit of hope to be honest um in a moment where i was so jaded and very sort of like i can't i can't even see a ray of hope she gave me something to hold on to um and there's something there so it's continuing to work with them to politicize them um to make them to help help them connect with different people across different african countries that are in the very same exact struggles but also recognizing that this is a new and there has been people that on on whose shoulders we stand that have done this fight um and continue to do this fight maybe in different ways but have been there and we're here because of them so making sure that we're connecting to that history and whose history as told by who is also very very important because the history that really matters many times is never written down you know you, you asked about that's a very great point you asked about um, you know african being civilized by europeans mm. and um you know the, the we talk about uh the greeks the so- socrates and, and uh, you know the aristotles and all coming to egypt way back um and finding the african civilization mm. and this talk about how it took socrates almost 40 years to be admitted to the academy mm-hmm. because the african academy did not you know to record things in books so you have to learn to memorize everything yeah. and you could not do that it took him that long yeah and then he went back uh, and started the conversations with plato and others which influenced then the greek philosophy the emergence of the greek philosophy that then later on influenced the roman philosophy so yeah. you actually civilized europeans that's my view yeah they're not true. civilized as um uh and and the other thing about governance is is uh, what you're trying to do with devolution is that most african societies that devolved power to the yeah. village council yeah yeah um, they had councils of elders we had councils yeah and, and we never and had individual yeah, I mean, at least not have, everyone but we didn't have monolithic yeah, even when we had a king in in some cases they had very strong councils advisory uh, councils very advisory councils yeah uh so in in a, in a way we were even more democratic than the europeans yeah at the, at the point of contact when they came yeah we had they came to the mandate colonize charter. us yeah yeah um and 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 how do we have this conversation how do you mainstream for example uh when you when you do these studies as now we mm-hmm. who who are you speaking to to try and yeah. influence so that we can start mainstreaming some of these so for now we um i recognize or at least we recognize that you can't really do both with equal fever like you can't be trying to frontline influence policy and advocacy at the same time as building and contributing to an african body of knowledge that is pan african that's feminist 
Um, so we've taken the build contributing to building the body of knowledge as our priority area. We do do some influencing on the policy and advocacy, but that's secondary to the actual, can we build our narratives? We need to ask the right questions because many a time research will come from the north and then you, you answer the questions that have been set for you. No, can we ask the questions ourselves? Can we articulate alternatives? And can we, can we also oscillate between the technical and the colloquial? So that's, that's a space we sit in. We do the technical analysis, but we also do the more creative work. And we hold that in equal measure. Um, Amilcar Cabral spoke a lot about the power of cultural work. And so it's that you can, you can have art for art's sake, but our art is steeped and very heavily so in a politics. So when we do, we have an anthology that um, documents snippets of time, snippets of resistance across time by African women on economic issues from the Nigerian women's war against um, market taxes to, you know, sex workers' res resistance to Wangari Mathai to um, the women's groups in Senegal reclaiming um, indigenous ways of growing food and using their own indigenous seeds, um, talking about food sovereignty. Um, to chamas and saving circles that so many African women communities practice in different ways, but it's really the same essence of solidarity economics. So documenting that and saying, actually, African women have been in resistance on economic issues and struggles all the time, like constantly. It's invisibilized. It's not seen as an economic struggle. It's not seen as a macro level economic struggle, but it is. And here, here are ways to do that. Um, so we don't do the frontline policy advocacy. So we do the building the knowledge. Who we influence is women's rights and feminist organizations to work with them to make the links to the macro level economic analysis because it has an impact whether you're working on social reproductive health and rights, whether you're working on ending violence against women, whether you're working on women's political leadership, it has an impact. It has a, it, there's a direct line to macro level economic policymaking and narratives, the way we understand the economy. We also are influencing mainstream economic justice organizations. And there are quite a number of organizations that are working on tax justice, on debt justice, on trade justice, and ensuring that in their analysis, there's a centering of a feminist analysis at the heart. When you're talking about debt at a sovereign level, you know, are you also making the connection to a household level? Because when countries are going through austerity measures, it is women who are then used by the state to plug in the gaps of like taking care of people, taking care of children, feeding families, all of those things that is unrecognized, underpaid, and not even paid at all. Um, so making sure that there's a strong feminist analysis there. So the Pan-African narrative, yes, has to be Pan-African, that's ours and sovereign, but must have a feminist underpinning in everything that it analyzes and looks at. So it's really putting that feminist lens on all the work that is being done for this continent and with this continent. It's a very interesting conversation that we cannot finalize in one show. Yeah. So you might have to do this again. Um, but then there are a lot of, uh, I talked about despondence within our society mm. um, and especially young people. Uh, we are in the, intersection between fourth and fifth industrial revolution yet some parts of kenya have not even undergone Wait, the agrarian the revolution revolution yeah what's the fifth the fifth the fifth is uh, where now ai and robotics are All taking right, over okay. you know um so that's not part of the fourth no that's, a that's whole other revolution. yeah that's it's a whole i can't keep up with the revolution revolution yeah <laughs> we, are, we are now because the fourth the fourth was about devices that make yeah. work easier yeah. for, for yeah. us yeah uh now work basically is not there anymore yeah. because we don't you can't uh, ai and robotics are going to do everything although can an ai anything replace a nurse a mother i don't think so no 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 no, no, no not that part actually yeah. that's the, the the human experience is going to be the next frontier for mm. me. That's that's what I think mm. in terms of even when you when you listen to experts, they're talking about, uh, for example, even a restaurant. You can you know, you know uh, I see in Japan restaurants being served by robots, but I don't think it's the same. Or even like what you studied, yeah. um, um, going to a national park, you cannot mm. replace that with a 
with a robot or uh, taking care of kids, mothering, that kind of thing. Although I'm sure uh, we ha that will be a contestation because uh, there, was a, there was a clip whereby they were showing babies being produced in a factory um, as a future. And, uh, and I'm sure there are some capitalists somewhere who are like, who are thinking of how now to that invest. you don't need human labor anymore, yeah, why don't we just do away with, yeah. you know? And yeah. you keep uh, give, getting babies so that you can get blood transfusion. Now, now that's dystopian. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> a real one. I mean, we are living in a little bit of a dystopia even now. But the reality is um, our current governments in Kenya and Africa have no idea on how to solve our issues. They give lip service. Mm -hmm. They promise young people bottom-up solutions, serikali ya mamandudi, I mean ya mamamboga na mtu wa boda. But the reality is um, we, we, despite having you know, extremely competent people in government, uh, policy makers and that kind of thing, the policies we are seeing don't seem to hope to, to you not know, to offer any hope to to our young people. Um, and if you look at the the, the, the recent budget uh, that is very extractive, you see a complete disregard to the you know to the dignity of the Kenyan or the African. Um, these guys just want to extract and extract. We have talked about the previous debts having been totally paid, yet they're still in our books. So this money is actually we are budgeting to loot. Um, and I'm painting a very bleak picture. Mm. What is the ray of hope? And, and, and especially from a feminist perspective, knowing that I mean, the people also, who suffer in these things are women mostly and, and kids. Yeah, because mm. women carry this continent literally and feed it and take care of it. Um, but it is a, it's a local leader, a national leader problem that intersects with a global architecture at the same time. So we're, we're like, I like to call it the structural adjustment program season two right now on Red Bull, if you will. So how it works is that you go into a debt crisis. Um, the World Bank comes in and says, well, we can offer you help to get out of this in form of new debt, but you have to restructure for you to pay back your debt. And restructuring in this case means um, cutting down public spending. The market will take care of things. The market will take care of your people. And we have private solutions for all of this. And we've got private finance that can, you have a problem with schools? There's a private finance solution. You have a problem with hospitals? There's a private finance solution for that. We can privatize all these things and it'll be fine. And so the freezing of public funding by government, our schools, and we know it, we know the story from the 80s and 90s where there was no more money for our schools, for our hospitals, our textile industry collapsed, dairy corporate, like all of those things that were very heavily supported by the state suddenly are in a state of flux. And what does what that in return does to a public consciousness is that private is better than public because public never works anyway. So we're all striving to make as much money as we can to send our children to private schools, to make sure that you have a job that has private health insurance, because as far away from anything publicly provided as you can get, the better you are able to live with more dignity. It's just better. You have very private solutions for all your public problems, from mm. water to rubbish mm. collection to mm. education, healthcare, mm. all of Security. that. Security. Mm. Four by fours. Exactly. Mm. You don't you have potholes, just get a four by four. And that social narrative, that narrative that our society tells itself also means that we're not claiming from the state what we should. Um, and then that opens a vacuum. And again, we're seeing the same thing as we navigate out of COVID. And so how do we begin to work on what our citizens believe in, what they think the social contract should be, how it should exist? But I think we're also missing an opportunity to work with younger children and to begin telling them a different story from when they're younger. Um, and I don't see very much of that. And I think that's where some hope lies. What stories are we telling them? What storybooks are they reading? Are they just reading Western storybooks or are they reading our own? Um, what songs are they singing? 
what cultural infusion are they being exposed to? I think for me, that's where a little bit of the hope lies in, if we're able to actually do that engagement. And I think we've spoken about reimagining the state, telling ourselves different stories um, is important. The story of America being, you know, the land of the brave home of the free, whatever it is, is steeped in their Hollywood, in their movies, in their cultural expressions. Um, and we sometimes seem to forget that the centrality of culture and cultural work mm. in this Ma work, said in this there's resistance. There's no revolution without a cultural revolution. Exactly. Amilcar Cabral also. Amilcar Cabral really, like, really spoke a lot about cultural work and its centering in, in, in the work of resistance. So I think that also gives me hope. Um, I was at a meeting in Entebbe two weeks ago, and the group went out for dinner along the lake at a local restaurant, and there was some children, not children, they were teenagers. Um, I don't know, they had a day off. I'm not so sure. My mother would have never let me just be dancing by the <laughs> lake at that time. But there wasn't a single Western song that they danced to. It was all Afrobeat. It was all Ugandan. It was all Kenyan. And I was like, that's so interesting because when I was a teenager, it was all Western music. I was we, shocked when I watched, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a video I watched of Banner Boy play, uh, performing in Spain. Mm. And you know, uh, the 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 whole stadium was full of Spanish people. He's singing in Nigerian, in pidgin, uh, and they're in pidgin singing and along. And they're singing along, and yeah. I was like, these guys have figured out um, exactly. And something is happening there um, that we really have to hone into and like re hold on to. And I think that gives me some hope that at least the younger generation is sort of like, there's a lot more pride in ourselves, in our way of dress. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i wearing jeans and your bottom's also not African, but there's something there. Um, so maybe that gives me some hope, but we, we really need to do a lot more investment, a lot more work in making sure that that happens um, and integrated into the civil society work that we do, but also the movements. And I, I can't, not emphasize this enough, the movements have to be at the center of resistance. As I said, they have always been there. They're there, they will always be. Whether governments change, whether donor priorities change, it's the movements that also do the work of intersectionality and joining thematic <laughs> priorities into a way that is understood through the lens of life. And at Naui, what we say is everything that we do has to be in service of life. Period. Service of life. In service of life. It has everything we do must be in service of life. Theorization is important. And again, I'll reference Lynn. She talks about how all processes must start in real life, in the concrete, and only then can you abstract and theorize. But even then, it must always, always, always land back in real life. And sometimes you get stuck in the theorization and the abstract. Um, and we forget that whatever we're theorizing must have been starting from real life experience and must always end in real life experience and having that at the back of our heads also helps with like knowing when to engage with different people when do you en engage with academics how do academics engage with movements what happens in that exchange and how do you break down power imbalances even between movements and the acad academic circles i think that's a conversation we have to have um and i think this there's expressions of it happening maybe not enough but there's definitely expressions of it happening and we just need to to keep pushing in that direction um yeah interesting that, that um you 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 think we should advocate to children because that's that's one of actually where um uh, mm -hmm. foundation um we have um category we want to engage with which is uh, eight or seven to preteens to 12 mm -hmm. and then 13 to, to 19 teens and then uh, 20 to 24. Um, and you're talking about, when you talk about the eight year old, the seven year old, you're talking about the people who will be voting 10 years from now. Um, if you can't influence the current citizens who are caught up in the Kenya Kwanzaa versus Azmi <laughs> and, you know, uh, narratives, how about we advocate to the, you know, to the, to the future voter? Um, and, and you know, one thing, if you look at uh, the organizations that have figured it out, including in capitalism, the corporations, um, church, 
uh, mosques, I mean, Islam, uh, Christianity. Yeah. Right wing You know, parties. they start with the kids. Yeah. Um, and I think civil society has been advocating to people who, whose world is already formed yeah. by other other spaces yeah. that it's very hard to change their worldview and maybe yeah. one of the things we want to explore in Muzalendo is how do we in the issues that face us existential climate change mm -hmm. uh, governance reimagining society reimagining even the state yeah. why not talk to the people who will be around yeah. uh, you know when we are gone because it's their future yeah. uh, the, the, some of us are too old to change our ways <laughs> it's true <laughs> you know? it's true we're also doing the same at Nawi. Um, it's very experimental right now, but um, yeah, looking at what we're looking to produce a children's book. Um, Nabila, who's one of our associates, is this is something that she's very passionate about, and she's going to a few a few African countries and having spaces with children and having conversations in ways that they understand, but centering around themes of social contracts and public services and things like that. Um, and we don't know what it's going to end up. And that's something also I think a lot of civil society, I think pushed by donors is like, you must always know what you're working towards. Sometimes you don't. And there's beauty in letting a process happen and landing where you will and not being too afraid of failure because that's how we learn love, and pivot. Love and that. Exactly, exactly. You can't, you can't be fighting for change in a predetermined way. I don't know. I really don't. Maybe this children book will be amazing and it'll change children's lives. Maybe it won't. Um, but we can only know if we try. And us saying that this will be the end point would be really lying. Um, so being brave enough to experiment and to try. Experiment might feel like a weird, but it is a little bit. Yeah, of, it's, it's, it is. Mm, it's trying. Mm, We're trying. Mm. Um, and it's in trying that we step away from the status quo. Um, from what feels safe and and sort of manageable and predictable. Um, but I think working with children is something that we have to do. We've left we've left it to education curriculums that I'm not so sure we're too confident in in TVs I mean, the, the, that the Kenyan the, the CBC curriculum was designed by British Council. I don't know why we are having our colonialist design our education system yeah. um, 60 years after yeah. independence. Yeah. They, you know. yeah. Um, and yeah, what are those stories that our children are told? And, and that forms their worldview. Um, what do they think of themselves as Kenyans, as Africans? What histories do they understand and remember? What stories of imagination do they know? Um, I don't have any children, but when I buy you know, my nieces and nephews books, I'm always trying to find African stories. And it's so hard. It's so, so hard um, to find. Um, and it's so much easier to buy Jack and Jill, whatever, you know, fragile, whatever the thing is. Um, and it's a lot harder to find our own. I know a few African authors who are writing books. There's Nadia from Cameroon. Nebula is now doing her. So there's a few, but they're hard to find. Um, distribution is not as easy for African authors as well. Um, but I guess it's where we have to. So, so we, have, we, have, we have to figure out how to mainstream yeah. some of this. We do. This, our books, our we stories, our, our cartoons, maybe, yeah. our videos. And also, I think also centering beauty is something that we talk a lot about at Nawi. Because there's this almost thought that as long as it's political, you don't really have to package it well. You don't have to. But actually, if you go to the bookshop and you're looking at like an African authored book versus a Western one with all the money for publishing and graphic design. I mean, as a child, I know which one I'm going for. Right. Um, so also the, the attention to the beauty of the details in which we package, in which we tell our stories, in which we dress our things. I think that's something that's very political that a lot of people don't see um that's part of the resistance as well the culture is political i mean if we uh, i think um again same conversation uh, one of the reasons me in my view that our uh, advocacy has not been succeeding is because it's not steeped in culture people don't identify with it they don't own it they don't see it as you know we wake up seven days a week on the, on the seventh day uh, we go to church. That's cultural. Exactly. It's not actually spiritual. And it's and back I, to that theme of ownership, right? Yeah. People go to church nowadays to show off their outfits and shoes and, and cars people. and that kind of thing. <laughs> and meet people and socialize, you know, become cultural. Yeah. Uh, and I think our movements have to figure out how to organize, to become a space that people 
go and socialize and yeah or go to yeah. the spaces yeah. that people socialize i don't mm. know can we have yeah. a conversation in a bar yeah you know yeah. um or at a church or mm. wherever it is that people go to mm. and dig you know dig, dignify the people exactly yeah Yeah. So thank you so much for making time. Thank you um, for holding this space. conversation could go on and we could, I think we could talk for a day. <laughs> yeah, we I could. Know, really, <laughs> but uh, we'll find time to We will uh, come to, back to, to it. To come back to it. Yeah. Um and I wish you and Nawi um all the best in this very complex uh thank very you. very it's a very challenging um area of exploration that yeah. you guys are, are working in. Yeah. Uh, but I I know that uh, we have capable people. And uh, I hope we're to, in good hands. We will host you again. Um, and and keep uh, doing your thing. Um caring about society um in the, in the Utu spirit. Um I think this is um it's mainstream but it's not amplified and I hope Utu now Zalendo can uh, start amplifying people like you who are doing what you do. Uh, and inspire others. Thank you very, very much mm. and all the very best. Asante sana. Mm.